Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. Our, as you know, our topic today is it's a, a very interesting topic of neurobiology of prehension. Uh, generally, we don't get uh, opportunity to talk about uh, neurobiology or prehension, but today we have uh, an expert with us, Dr. Takesh Singh, who is uh, heading the lab, uh, Sensory Motor Neuroscience and Learning Laboratory uh, and in, at Department of Kinesiology, Pennsylvania State University, uh, Philadelphia. So uh, welcome Dr. Takesh Singh, it's uh, we're great to have you with us. Uh, thank you, Prakash. So uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, this is the first time I'm actually giving an online lecture to people in India, so I'm very delighted about it. Uh, so it's also an honor to actually be able to talk about uh, the neurobiology of prevention. Uh, so uh, I'm just let me just get started right away. So just to give give you a brief background about myself, actually my uh, academic journey started uh, in India. I grew up in India and I did my bachelor's in uh, chemical engineering actually at the Indian Institute of Technology in Bombay. And when I was done, I kind of realized that uh, engineering was not something, especially chemical engineering was not something that I really enjoyed doing. So I moved into movement science. I first got my master's from uh, the Nanyang Technological University and then moved over to Penn State where I am currently a faculty. I did my PhD there. Uh, and then I moved around. Uh, so my PhD was in motor control, uh, movement sciences. And then I did a bunch of postdoctoral fellowships at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, the Medical University of South Carolina, and so on. Uh, and I moved a little bit into stroke rehabilitation, stroke neuroscience. Uh, then I started a faculty position at the University of Georgia, where I was between 2017 and 2020. And now I'm finally at the uh, uh, Department of Kinesiology in the College of Health and Human Development at Penn State, where, uh, as Prakash mentioned, I direct the Sensory Motor Neuroscience and Learning Laboratory. So today uh, we're going to talk about the neurobiology of prehension, and uh, I did uh, some research in prehension during my PhD. And so what I will try to do today is to give you a very broad picture of prehension in terms of what we know, both from human models, animal models, and I'm trying to, and I'm going to try to focus uh, most of my talk to make it more relevant from a translational standpoint or from an applied standpoint. So uh, and uh, I'm going to start off with this uh, quote, actually. Uh, this quote is actually from a Scottish philosopher, and this is, uh, it says that man is a tool, man is a tool using animal. Without tools, he is nothing, and with tools, he is all. And the reason I picked this up is because I feel like it's that, you know, whatever role we see around us, whatever, you, you know, see anything that we have made as humans, which we haven't inherited, from the planet itself, all of that stuff has been made possible because of our ability to grasp objects, because of our prehension capabilities. And none of this would be possible if we could not um, you know, grab or rather grasp objects. So I want, so I think that what also, it's also important to understand that this is the one of the capabilities that differentiates us from most of the other animals on the planet and also gives us a unique ability to be able to build objects and create objects. So today, uh, this is these are the three topics I will kind of talk about. I will first talk, uh, even though grasping is kind of a very broad topic, um, I will only focus on those two specific paradigms uh, in which we have done a lot of research studies. And when I say we, I mean the field has done a lot of research studies and we understand the neurobiological aspects of uh, of these paradigms quite well, or or how these these uh, actions are executed. So the first one is reach to grass movements, and um, I'll, I'll, if you don't know what this is, I'll obviously it's I think it's quite intuitive, but I will also explain that in my talk. And the second one is uh, power grasp and precision grasp. So basically, the ability to grasp an object uh, with the fingertips or with the palm itself. And I will talk a little bit about those as well, and what we know about um, these two actions. So let's get started with the uh, the behavioral paradigms for grasping. So the first one that I will talk about is the reach to grasp behavior. And this is one of the most commonly used paradigms in the literature. 
And essentially, it just means that, you know, you start from rest and you're actually going to grab an object. The object could be of different shapes, sizes. And essentially what happens is that as our hand approaches the object, our fingertips basically, uh, you know, create an opening to be able to grab that object. And as you'll see here in the, uh, you know, figure in the bottom, that depending upon the size of the object, the grip aperture or the, you know, the difference between say these two fingers in, um, in millimeters or centimeters, that expands as a function of approach. And as we approach the object, it again, so at first we increase it and the size is scaled based on the size, uh, the size of the grip aperture is scaled based on the size of the object. And as we begin to approach the object, it again, you know, closes in and allows us to grab the object. So it has a reach component and a grip landing component. And I will talk about both today. And I'll also talk about, um, you know, the precision and the power grasps. So what you see on the left is what we call a power grasp. So power grasp is basically something, you know, that I would hold on to like this, like a hammer, for example, the way we grab a hammer is an example of our power grasp. And the way I'm holding on to this pen right now is an example of a precision grasp. So basically using fingertips to be able to grab objects. And the reason I'm showing you this is because again, I think we have the neurobiological under, uh, basis of how these two graphs were execu executed quite well understood and that has also informed our understanding of you know how these uh the ability to grasp objects is impaired in certain clinical populations and i will talk about some of that later so let's start with the neurobiology of reach to grasp movement so uh, these movements have been studied in both animals and humans in very uh, different ways. So here's some examples, and I took this figure from a review paper uh, from by Umberto Castiello uh, in the Neuroscientist, uh, which is a journal, which is a very prominent journal in our field. And here he has a figure to show, you know, how these movements have been studied with monkeys. So monkeys obviously are one of the most important behavioral models to help our understanding. And I will explain in a second why uh, monkeys have helped us understand uh, reach to grass movements in, uh, in, in a way better than any other animal model. And so here you see, you know, the monkey making a grasp to different objects. Uh, then we've also done simple behavioral studies, which you can see here in the bottom right, which is, you know, like you put markers uh, on the hand, you look at how people, you know, their finger uh, shape or the grip aperture changes as a function of approaching the object. And finally, what we can also do uh, is that we can actually put people in a uh, uh, in an MRI scanner and look at their brain activity as well to, uh, while they are doing reach to grass movements. And the good thing is with the, you know, in an MRI scanner where the head needs to be fairly still, we can do reach to grass movements while keeping the head still. And that is one of the great things to be able to, you know, do so that it gives us some understanding of which neural circuits in the brain are engaged when we do reach to grasp movements. So these are the different paradigms, you know, in humans shown at the bottom and uh, animals shown at the top, which have kind of given us an understanding of how these actions are executed. All right. Okay. So one of the first things that I know that I want to tell you is that um, the visually guided reaching movement, and again, I have this, you know, visual at the very top. Uh, it is the reach to grasp movement is a movement which is which develops under visual guidance. And what that means is that uh, when you know infants when they first learn how to make you know these kind of movements, they are all over the place. But the ability to actually scale the grip aperture as a function of approach distance, it develops over time. It takes months and years to develop, uh, actually. And only, I think, by the second or third year are in, you know, children able to do this, uh, this quite well. And what that, what that actually entails is that it, it, um, when these, the skill is being learned, these circuits, the one that goes, so this is again, uh, uh, an orient, you know, like just to orient you, this is the visual cortex of the brain at the very back. And this is the parietal areas of the brain. 
And so these circuits that are involved in reach to grasp, they develop slowly and under visual guidance. And so a lot of research that has been done on reach to grass movements have focused on these circuits here and how they develop. And the way we probe these circuits in the laboratory is especially, you know, we use a lot of uh, and different people use augmented or virtual reality. So what they would do is they would present a virtual object. And as the, you know, the arm is reaching that object, they will either change its orientation, its size, uh, or make the object disappear and see how that quickly that grip can, can adapt. And while they're also looking at activity in the parietal areas. And that gives us a lot of insight into how these circuits have evolved uh, during um, during development to be able to uh, to be able to make reach to grass movements. But finally, you know what these circuits have to do here is that they have to communicate with the motor areas of the brain, right? So the motor areas, the motor cortex is the one that will eventually send out the drive to the spinal cord for us to be able to you know make the reach movement as well as the uh, the grasping component of the movement. So I've listed some of these studies here uh, from this figure, but there are tons of different studies uh, from different groups that have focused on the interaction between the parietal areas, the premotor areas, and the motor areas to understand how this reach to grass movement is actually performed. And I will summarize some of them here today. So what one of the things that uh, again, different studies, monkeys and humans have kind of elaborated, is that there are different neural circuits that are involved in the reach component of the reach to grasp and the grasp component of the reach to grasp. And here I'm showing a summary. This is a, a slide from uh, not our book, but uh, uh, Candel, the Eric Candel and Schwartz Principles of Neuroscience book. And I think it does a very good job of summarizing how these circuits operate. So if you look at the very top here, uh, these circuits. So this is again the again to orient you. This is a monkey brain, by the way. Uh, here's the visual cortex. These are the parietal areas. These are the premotor areas, uh, the dorsal premotor cortex, the ventral premotor cortex, and the motor cortex. And what you'll see in this is that the more dorsal circuits, the ones that actually originate in these lateral intraparietal, the medial intraparietal areas, these actually communicate with the dorsal premotor cortex, and they are primarily responsible for the reach component of the movement. So they are the ones that help us transport our arm from point A to point B when we are making a reaching movement. When you look at the bottom, what you'll see is that these are the more lateral or the more ventral areas of the uh, parietofrontal circuit. So these again, for example, uh, the anterior intraparietal area is a common node uh, in the parietal cortex. And this communicates with the ventral premotor cortex or what we call area F5 in the monkey. And I will talk about this area again in a couple of slides to talk about why this communication is critical for grasp. There are certain neurons in this area called the canonical neurons, which uh, help us basically shape our fingers. And I will talk about that in a second. But essentially what happens is that as we're making these movements, these two circuits, the, the ones which are more dorsal that are shown on the top and the ones that are more ventral, they are simultaneously engaged and they allow us to, uh, to do this. And how we know these circuits are involved. So for example, if we disrupt one of these areas, say for example, the anterior intraparietal area with something called transcranial magnetic stimulation, or that's one of the common ways in which these areas uh, can be temporarily inhibited. What you'll see is that the grass component will be disrupted, but the reach component will be intact and vice versa. So, so we know that, so these, there are studies which have kind of identified the causal role of these areas using TMS and other sorts of perturbations. So, so these are areas that are quite well known um, in the reach to grass literature. Now, as you see this, you know, for those of you who kind of, I, I mean, you, many of you may have heard about uh, the dual pathway, the dual visual stream hypothesis. And if you don't know, I'm just gonna summarize it here briefly for you. So these are studies that were done, uh, some really landmark studies in the early 80s uh, by uh, Melvin Goodale, uh, you know, uh, and a few others who actually showed that when visual information reaches uh, the visual cortex, so, you know, from the retina back to the visual cortex, it kind of, you know, di diverges into two parallel streams. The one that what we call the dorsal or the wear stream, which basically goes from here um, up to the parietal cortex, and that's shown here on the top. So let me actually see, sorry. 
uh, if I can, can I actually change this to, no, it's just clicking. Let me go back. I think I'm going in the opposite direction. Yes, I am. So something is not right. Yeah, my bad, sorry. So um, this is the stream that you see here, this is a spatial stream. So what it does is it helps us identify where objects are in space uh, with respect to each other, with respect to the body. And this stream plays a very important role in visual motor control of movements. Whereas the other stream that you see, this is called the ventral stream or the ventral pathway. And this is involved in you know, shape recognition, color recognition. So it helps us identify blue from green and red and so on, different shapes. Uh, and if you go further down the stream, we have the fusiform face area, which helps us identify you know, one person from, the, uh, from, other, uh, from another. And this stream is involved in like, you know, like it's called the perceptual stream. And when you look at this architecture, what you'll also notice is that the grasping architecture is not very different. It has, it has the same kind of architecture. Uh, so when you look at, uh, so this is the uh, two visual stream on the left. When you look at the uh, reach uh, um, control pathways, you'll see that this dorsal stream, which you see over here is, is pretty much the same. Um, and that's uh, and this dorsal stream actually has two components. One component, which we call the more dorsal dorsal component, which is what's involved in the reach control of movements, and the other one that we call the dorsal the ventral dorsal stream, which is involved partially in the grasp component. And so, if we go back here, I want to point you again that you know that what we need eventually is that these parietal areas, which process visual information they need to be communicating with both these, the dorsal premotor and the ventral premotor areas for us to be able to plan and execute uh, the movement. So that's what you see over here. That's the, this is the ventral dorsal stream. And finally, we have the ventral stream and the ventral stream is involved in object recognition. So when we see different objects, say for example, you know, a phone compared to uh, a pen, we need to be able to recognize these objects to be able to plan our grasp. And that is made possible by this stream, the ventral stream, uh, because it helps us recognize objects. And what this does is, and so if you go back to this, so what I'm, I want you to kind of pay attention to is, is these two streams, the ventral dorsal and the ventral stream, which are kind of critical for grasping, and this dorsal dorsal stream, which is important for uh, reaching. So, the reason how we, or maybe what we, and the reason why we, uh, or not reason, but perhaps how we figured out that these areas are important for grasping is again through a lot of studies first done by uh, Rizalati and colleagues with monkeys who did a lot of work uh, on canonical neurons. Uh, this is a group out of Italy. And what they figured out was that there are in the preventral cortex of the monkey, which is, uh, or area F5, which is the same as our uh, ventral premotor cortex. There are these neurons called the canonical neurons. And what these neurons do is that they encode the shape of an object. So if your cup, for example, was the pen, they tell us what the shape is and how much does the grip need to be, uh, the grip aperture need to be expanded? How much does it need to be, how wide does it need to be to be able to grab this object? Because keep in mind, anytime we're grabbing these objects, usually what we would do is that the grip aperture would kind of scale um, more than the you know width of the object, and then it comes down to grab uh, so that we can grab the object. So that is made possible by um, by this area, the uh, the uh, the, uh, the prefrontal uh, cortex or area F five, and then it is this projection from area AIP to the PMV which makes it possible. So this has been called different things. It's been called you know that this is uh, like uh, the psychologists have called this an affordance-based approach to grasping because what we really realize is you know not just how um, how wide the object is but what we want to do with it. So for example, if I want to take a cup to, to take a sip of you know coffee, I would drink it very I would grab it very differently compared to if I want to hold it to put it into a dishwasher, right? So my grab uh, my grasp would be very different. But the idea is that regardless of how I want to grab it or what I want to do with it, these circuits will be engaged. The ones from area AIP to the canonical neurons are in the, in the uh, ventral premotor areas. And finally, the stream that you see at the bottom, the ventral stream, this actually allows us to um, 
to, to understand what those objects are, to recognize a cup from a pen, from say a mouse and so on. So that's what that tree allows us to do. Now, important I think is that as I've mentioned, you know, that most of what we are, we've understood is again, a lot of this work has been done in monkeys. And, uh, you know, monkeys are one of our closest, you know, I think I would say allies in the animal kingdom in terms of how our brains are very similar. Uh, so there's a lot of understanding that we can we can derive from, from monkeys. So uh, a, a lot of work has been done in monkeys, but usually the work in monkeys has, the, the that work has informed our understanding of how to design experiments in humans uh, so that the humans can be taken to like an MRI scanner and we do the studies. And there are studies, and I'm just showing you one of those studies here. This is by a group in Japan. And what they've done is that they have confirmed that these circuits that have been identified in the monkeys, the, the three circuits that I just mentioned, so the dorsal dorsal, which is reach, the ventral dorsal, which is involved in uh, the grass planting, and that converges into the premotor areas, and then the ventral stream, which is involved in identifying objects, all those circuits are the same as in humans. And this is again, so they, these researchers used dynamic causal modeling, you know, and they asked people to grab different kinds of objects. And what they showed was that the same areas are engaged in a very similar fashion. So this gives us a lot of confidence that um, the circuits that are engaged in reach to grass movements are very similar between humans and monkeys. And, and, and uh, also that when we want to understand how, for example, stroke, uh, which could cause certain, uh, which could cause damage in certain areas, how that might impact uh, reach to grass movements in both uh, monkeys as well as as well as humans. Now, another thing that, uh, which is a very recent uh, area of research, and we we don't know much about it, but I did want to bring this to your attention. So. I mentioned the dorsal stream, the ventral stream, which we first came to know about 40 years ago. And then I think, you know, that work has also kind of helped us understand the reach to grass movements through understanding of these three pathways, the dorsal, dorsal, ventral, dorsal, and the ventral pathways. But when we look at that literature, you know, it almost seems like that these circuits process information in parallel for us to be able to make uh, reach to grass movements. But in reality, you know, the brain is far more complex than this simplification. So this is work that uh, actually I, I came across a few years ago and uh, I was really very fascinated with it for different reasons because, um, you know, when I was starting my post, uh, finishing off my postdoctoral work, I had this idea, and uh, again, this was not based out of anything uh, real, but just some of the ideas that I was thinking that perhaps there's also should be ways in which the dorsal and the ventral stream might communicate with each other uh, during the planning and execution of movements. So if you go back to, let me go back to this model and show you how historically it has been envisioned that these streams interact. So the way this, these streams interact, or at least we have hypothesized that they interact, is that um, the ventral stream, you know, like you see over here, that it, it actually, there's a lot of input that goes from the ventral stream to the prefrontal areas. And then those prefrontal areas through the premotor areas communicate through feedback connections with these circuits. And that's how we've historically envisioned that these two streams might interact with each other. But this recent stuff, actually, I don't know if there's a question. Let me just. I hope you guys can hear me, right? Prakash, are you able to hear me? I'm not sure. Yeah, if, yeah. If, OK, all right, thank you. So uh, what the, this group, and again, this, uh, I, I'm not sure how to pronounce her last name, Bodhisattva um, Levchevich, I think. She's a, uh, she's a researcher in Italy, and uh, this work was published in uh, the journal Cortex. 
And what they showed was that um, there are white matter tracks that actually connect the dorsal and the ventral stream. So, so if you look here, I hope you guys can see the that there's a brain, a picture of a brain in the back. And what they did was they actually looked at these pathways, the ones that are hypothesized to connect these two streams, the dorsal and the ventral stream. And then uh, what they did was they actually asked people to conduct behavioral studies, reach to grab studies, so reach to an object, grab an object and lift it in the lab. And then they looked at these pathways. They looked at, uh, they took the people, the, the participants into a scanner and they did diffusion tensor imaging. And they looked at these tracks, the number of tracks or the integrity of these tracks. And what they found was that the, the tracks or the, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the functional anisotropy of these tracks, these kind of predictors which are used in diffusion studies, these were predictive of, um, of reach to grass movement. So for example, as you'll see here, so this is what, so here this means that, uh, you know, these pathways are strongly involved. And so what they showed was that these white matter tracks play a very critical role in grasping movements. So, so not only do these streams operate in parallel, that when a reach to grasp movement is, is being made, there is communication through these white matter tracks, likely, I mean, this is not a, a MRI study, this is a diffusion in imaging study, which is a structural study, this is not a functional study. What they hypothesize is that based on these results, these structural results and you know, variable results, that there's a very strong chance that this pathway that you see here in blue, this actually plays a role in online coordination between the dorsal stream and the ventral stream so that people can make uh, you know, uh, accurate reach to grass movements to different objects. So there, there should be a lot of, there should be follow-up to this as well. I, I don't, I haven't uh, seen anything else come out of this literature or this, this, these kind of studies where people look at the interaction between these two streams. But this uh, is something I do want to point out that is, a, is, it seems to be a new emerging area in the field of reach to grass movements. And Again, you know, like how we know that these uh, that these areas, the ones that I told you, you know, the 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 parietal cortex, the premotor areas, and different nodes in the parietal and the premotor areas are involved in these movements is through again uh, studies of pati uh, patients who have optic ataxia. So optic ataxia is basically the simplest way to think about it. And there are many ways, many reasons how optic ataxia can happen, but. Uh, what we've mostly looked, uh, what people have mostly looked at in the literature are people who have suffered some kind of damage to the parietal cortex. And when there is damage to the parietal cortex, there is difficulty that these patients experience with reach to grasp movements. So what you see here on the left is that, you know, when people are trying to make a, a grasping movement, they, they shape their, you know, finger movements. And you'll see that the normal people who do not have damage, they're able to do it quite well. It's, it's a very straightforward thing that we learned during motor development. But somebody who has optic ataxia, you can see that their ability to, to you know, uh, get the, the thumb and the index finger into what we kind of call like an opposition space to grab objects is kind of impaired. Uh, also, when you ask these patients to make reaching movements to say, uh, these are studies that are called slot studies. So what people do is, you know, you in a kind of this uh, desk, you would create a kind of different slot and say, can you try to get your hand into the slot? And you'll expect that people who have no impairment can do it very easily, whether the slot is oriented vertically, horizontally, or at some angle, it's very easy to do. But here, what you'll see is that patients with optic ataxia have difficulty. And finally, when you see again, like, you know, reach to grass movements, you'll see that, so this, for example, here B is a normal uh, reach to grass movement. So this is um, a person with unilateral, I think, optic ataxia, which meant that they were able to, like they were only damaged to one hemisphere. So you'll see that in this case, you know, uh, their A, uh, this hand was affected and this hand was not affected. So you'll see that the affected hand has, uh, you know, it is very different in terms of its movement than the unaffected hand. And when you also look at different patients, so here, uh, these are initials of different patients. Uh, LK and BS are actually healthy uh, controls. So you can see that their grip aperture shows the same signatures that we saw at the very beginning of this lecture, where 
you know, we people gradually begin to expand their grip aperture and then it closes down as the hand approaches the object. And what you'll see in this patient with optic ataxia that is much more delayed. They actually expand their fingers way more than the than necessary compared to the size of the object. And the closing in is also very, very different. So this is how it's kind of, you know, like we, we figured out that uh, that there are these deficits uh, in uh, in planning of um, leash to grass movements that occur because of uh, damage to the parietal areas. Now, I think it is. I think it's also important to understand that um, these are not damage to motor areas that we are looking at. These are damage to the. This is damage to the parietal cortex. Because if there's damage to the motor cortex, you can, you can expect difficulties in any movement, right? Not just like a reach to grasp, but even moving a limb from point A to point B. But what these reach to grasp studies and with this simple behavioral paradigm have been able to do is to kind of give us an insight into how um, the reach and the grasp components are simultaneously planned and executed. And only with specific damage to the parietal areas are we able to see how this movement is, is in, I mean, is impaired and how the ability to grasp objects are, are impaired. So I just wanted to clarify as well that this is not damage to the motor area, this is damage to the parietal areas. These are people who don't likely have spasticity or you know, any of those um, stronger impairments that we typically tend to see with damage to the motor cortex or the uh, the corticospinal tract. All right, so I'm gonna shift gears now um, and I'm gonna move over to the next part of the talk. So, so far, um, we've just talked about reach to grasp and i would summarize it by saying that most of this work actually kind of for good reasons and for thankfully for good reasons, I, uh, started uh, or came out of the work from the visual neuroscience literature because it informed our understanding of how visual information flows and how it finally gets to the premotor areas, which are involved in movement planning and execution. And so from that, we figured out that there are three parallel pathways, which are involved in the dorsal dorsal in reach, the ventral dorsal in grasp planning, and the ventral in object identification or dif differentiating one object from the other. I also showed you some recent studies which have found that there are white matter pathways that connect these different regions. And that help with the online, uh, or when I say online, it is you can think of it as a simultaneous control of the, the grip posture with the reaching movement, and also how damage to the parietal areas uh, affect uh, these reach to grasp movements. All right. So let's move on to the neurobiology of precision grasp. So before I get started um, with this uh, part of the lecture, I, I do want to do a basic recap. Uh, and most of you, I'm guessing, who are here, you probably already know this pretty well. Um, so again, this is uh, on the left. What you see here is the corticospinal tract, right? So the corticospinal tract, we know that the cell bodies of the corticospinal tract are mostly in the uh, motor cortex, the premotor areas, about five to ten percent are also in the somatosensory cortex, for reasons that are not quite clear, but they are there. And then you know you uh, so so that's uh, where the cell bodies are, and then this tract basically decussates, and it primarily innervates you know the motor units that finally uh, you know that actually uh, activate the more distal muscles of of the hand, right? So this is these are this is stuff. That is quite well understood and known. Uh, then on the right, uh, uh, and the reason I'm pointing this out is because we also know that the strong, uh, that how important the corticospinal tract is for precision grasps, our ability to grasp objects with fingers or, you know, button up our shirts, tie our shoelaces, all these fine movements that we do with our fingers. Then on the right, what you see is the reticulospinal tract, right, which is, uh, Basically, it starts at the brainstem 
and it is uh, it actually on the spinal cord it projects more medially uh, and then it projects to the motor units or the lower motor neurons that are involved in the axial control partial control and so on and then also project to these large shoulder muscles and and so on and we know that these are these this tract is actually quite important for uh for grasping uh for for power grasps and the re i mean one of the reasons why how we have figured out uh, and again these are not you know uh, but this these are studies that have looked at the on the whole evolutionary spectrum and i uh, really would like you to actually if you haven't read this paper by roger lemon uh, please take a look at this uh, paper it's, a, it's an awesome paper and the hypothesis that we have is that there are only two animals in the entire kingdom, animal kingdom that have the ability to perform a precision grasp. One of them is obviously, you know, us humans and old world monkeys. And, and what that precision grasp means is that, you know, we have something like an, what we call a thumb, an opposable thumb that can actually go and create an opposition space to these fingers so that we can grab objects like this and, you know, using an opposition space. And the hypothesis is that the reason why we can do that is because we have one of, you know, our corticospinal tract is one of the most developed corticospinal tracts in the animal kingdom. So we have way more fiber spinal cord tract in this, uh, and that allows us this ability to be able to uh, grab objects in an opposition space. Now, I briefly mentioned this earlier, but I just want to again point uh, this out that this is the corticospinal tract and, you know, the cell bodies actually, this is area, uh, uh, these numbers four and six here indicate Broadman areas. So this is motor cortex, premotor cortex, somatosensory cortex, also the parietal areas. And th the corticospinal tracts consist of, you know, these neurons whose cell bodies are in all these areas. Most of them are in areas four and six, about 90 to 95%, but we also have cell bodies that are in areas area three in the somatosensory cortex and parietal areas. Why? We don't know. I think that part of it could also be to facilitate grasping movements, but at this point, they are, uh, we don't know for sure. So I, I, I just want to say that whatever I'm saying right now is purely speculative. I, we don't have a reason. They, we do know that uh, these neurons, uh, these cell bodies could be playing some role in sensory gating. There have been quite a few studies on that. Uh, I, I, I don't have time to go over what sensory gating is now, but if you have any questions about it, I can answer it during Q&A. But I feel like there's perhaps a very good reason why we also have these structures here that might be facilitating uh, precision graphs somehow. The second thing that I think is quite, so besides the corticospinal tract playing a very key role and the developed corticospinal tract in uh, old world monkeys and humans, the other thing that plays uh, an important role in precision grasp are the tactile afferents, right? And again, for those of you who, uh, many of you may know, but some of you, if you don't know, so tactile afferents are basically, you know, these, uh, these uh, mechanical receptors on the skin of, you know, the, the glabrous skin, which basically tell us exactly, you know, they 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 uh, they respond to pressure, and what they tell us is, in a nutshell, what kind of object we are grasping. So there are different kinds, you know. They, you have the fast adapting ones that you see here on the uh, and the slow adapting ones, and there are four different kinds. Two of them that are actually very close to the surface, and they are called the Meissner corpuscles and the Merkel uh, endings, and what they do is they have very small receptor fields and they respond to different kinds of deformation. So the fast adapting ones, you can think of it that they respond to the rate at which we change. So if, for example, I'm grabbing this pen and I start to change the force. When I change the force, when the, the, so that when the force profile changes, the fast adapting ones are the ones that primarily respond to that. And they, they, they communicate in the nervous system that, okay, now the force is being increased. Where the slow adapting ones, they respond more to steady state force. So, you know, like if I'm grabbing this pen at a steady state, the, the, the Merkel endings are the ones that are primarily responding to uh, and communicating with my brain. 
to tell my brain that, okay, I'm holding an object, which is say hundred grams or something. And for example, if I do the same thing with a cup, again, this is steady state. At this point, you know, the, the, the Merkle endings are responding and telling my brain that I'm holding an object, which is heavier than this, for example. Then you have other ones as well, which are kind of deeper into the skin. And I, I'm not going to go into that much, but you can read about that in any neuroscience textbook. Uh, they, they, prep, they could help more with the power graphs because they have much larger receptive fields. They are deeper in the skin and they would like, for example, help us, you know, like understand one hammer from a more heavier hammer, for example, which we're holding something like this. But for precision grip, grip these two, which are closer to the surface of the skin, play a much important role. And I will point you to this very, uh, you know, nice Nature Neuroscience Review paper from 2009, where uh, Randy Johansson and, um, sorry, uh, Johansson and Flanagan, Randy Flanagan and, and Roald Johansson, they actually did this study uh, and they summarized a lot of different studies. And what they did was they looked at, you know, uh, how people grab objects, how they apply a grip force. The grip force is the perpendicular force that we apply to objects. And what they showed was that when you, you know, grab an object and the grip force increases, that's when you see increase in firing rate in, for example, the fast adapting ones. At steady state, you see a steady amount of firing in the slow adaptive ones, which is this one, right? This one, which is closer to the skin, for example. And essentially their role has been kind of like, you know, well understood, well studied. And the reason I'm pointing this out to you is the role of these tactile afferents is because these tactile afferents are critical for us to be able to hold objects or grab objects in a steady fashion. And because all of this tactile information, you know, the one that actually originates in these mechanical receptors, Eventually, it had, it'll find its way through the cuneate nucleus into the thalamus and into the somatosensory cortex. And if there is damage to any of these regions along this pathway, whether in the periphery in the tactile receptors or in the somatosensory cortex because of stroke, it would most likely affect the ability to be able to grasp objects for, for certain. And just two weeks ago, uh, I think that I mean, probably in India, you don't. There's a there's a very good journal, um, a weekend journal, you know, like a show called Sixty Minutes that on uh, on US television that many Americans watch. And uh, just two weeks ago, there was a show of this title, you know, Advancements in Prosthetics Limbs Technology Allow Feeling Control. So if you Google Sixty Minutes and just put this link in, you'll be able to find. It's a very nice fifteen minute segment, which tells us how important this ability to feel or get information from these tactile afferents are for us to be able to grab objects and in, in a stable fashion. So I strongly recommend, uh, and in, in that uh, article, they actually interviewed this researcher, uh, Sliman Benz Maya. He is a researcher at the University of Chicago and he's done a lot of work on these tactile afferents and how they you know, project to the somatosensory cortex and allow humans to be able to you know, do these kind of precise tasks with their fingertips. Now, in terms of motor control, you know, I said that uh, what allows us to do this precision grasp is basically an opposable thumb. And only uh, old world monkeys and humans have an opposable thumb. Like this is what we can do. And this is what makes it possible for us to do something what I, you know, you see me do right now. And this idea, Actually, so in robotics in the late 80s, roboticists who were trying to you know, develop grasping robots, they came up with the idea that you know, they should also create an opposable thumbs because obviously humans are pretty good at that. And they create this idea of you know, that the thumb is a virtual finger which opposes the other fingers. And so this thumb, they call it the virtual finger one, and then they call all the other fingers virtual finger two. And my PhD work, and you know, when I was in the lab uh, with Mark Latash and Vladimir Zatsevsky, they were both my PhD mentors. They create this very beautiful model, which uh, I think has really informed our understanding of how, you know, humans use five fingers to coordinate precision. Because keep in mind, in the reach to grasp, we were mostly looking at the thumb and the index finger. But I mean, typically we use all four fingers and the thumb. And what they suggested was that the way motor control is organized is in a hierarchical fashion. 
So at the first level, we have a virtual finger, which is the thumb. And then all of the combined sum of these four fingers should be considered a second virtual finger or virtual finger two. And so the nervous system first decomposes the problem into at the higher level, it treats this as one unit and this as the second unit. And then at the lower level, it basically delegates control to each of these fingers and it solves the problem in a hierarchical way. And this is important when we think about grip force, for example, because when we apply grip force, you can imagine that the sum total of these four forces should exactly be the same as the thumb, which means that VF1 and VF2 should exactly be equal. But VF2, which is the second virtual finger, it divides these four forces, the total force amongst these four fingers, right? How does it do it? That is basically the area of study, which was kind of done by, you know, uh, which we, which there's a lot of literature on, but what Latash and Zatsevsky did was figure out that, hey, this is how the nervous system solves the problem. And you can look up this uh, review paper in which they've summarized some of these findings, which is very important to understand how the nervous system does this in a hierarchical fashion. The other thing that they discovered, um, which is very important is also the ability to individually control these four fingers. So this is at the lower level, at this level I'm talking about right now. So what they found was that if, for example, I, uh, let me take a notebook here to illustrate this point, that if I'm, you know, pressing with my fingers, uh, you know, on these, on, on a book like this, and I just ask people to control the force of the index finger. If you apply force with just the index finger, you have, we have very little control on how much force these other fingers apply. They will apply some force as well, which means that our ability to control forces individually is limited. And this has been, you know, um, this uh, has been termed and uh, studied within the area of what we call finger fractionation or individuation or uh, a now term that people don't use anymore because obviously of uh, reasons which are historically um, uh, burdensome, which is that, you know, we, we used to start, we used to call it enslaving, but that's a term which no, which people have stopped using uh, lately. But our ability to control these finger forces individually are important for us to be able to delegate how at the lower level of the hierarchy, we can control forces. And part of these abilities, this constraint simply because of biomechanical constraints, because of tendons, you know, which of these extrinsic muscles, which project to multiple different fingers, but there's also neural coupling. And some of this work I think is very well captured in this review paper by Mark Schieber and Marco Centello. And they talk about both peripheral constraints and neural constraints on how, on what determines or uh, limits our ability to control these finger forces individually. And the reason why this is important is again, as I mentioned, we can, can our ability to, can, to, to do precision grasp is because of the corticospinal tract. The corticospinal tract is what gives us the ability to be able to do precision grasps. So I'm showing you this, um, and this is my last slide actually, uh, but I do wanna uh, make sure that I make this point clearly is that, uh, so this is a study that came out of John Krakauer's group at Johns Hopkins. And what they did study stroke survivors. And what they looked at was that people who suffered damage to the corticospinal tract, their ability to perform fine finger movements, like you know, precision grasp or playing a piano is obviously affected. But then, you know, with over time, you know, they recover some of that function. So what they were trying to do was they were trying to, so these are images, you know, like these are again, uh, average images over multiple different, you know, stroke survivors. Uh, they looked at, you know, damage to the corticospinal tract, cortical areas, and so on. And what they found was that the recovery, the strength recovery, which is the ability to simply like produce force and, you know, fine finger movement, which is, uh, and the way that they, they measured that was using a very similar paradigm that, you know, Mark and Dr. Uh, Vladimir Zatsirsky had developed, which is to ask people to produce forces on sensors and look at the capacity to uh, produce individual forces. What they found was that those two kind of recover independently. And so you can see that, you know, this is on the X axis here is strength recovery. On the Y axis is the ability to, to you know, uh, recover individuation. And you'll see that in the beginning, they recovered together. 
but by about 60% of strength recovery, the individuation is almost complete. And beyond that point, they are unable to, you know, move finger uh, movements uh, or uh, recover finger movements individually if there is damage to cortical spinal tract. So this is kind of, you know, our current understanding of how the cortical spinal tract plays a very important role and that damage to this tract can actually affect our ability to, to you know, grab, uh, uh, to make precision grasps. So I know that I cover a lot of ground, but these are all my references, and I'm happy to also share these slides with Prakash, and he can share this with you if you need. But this is just a broad summary of, you know, I think what we know about reach to grass movements, precision grass, how they're controlled, what happens when there's damage to the tactile uh, receptors, somatosensory cortex, uh, which will affect our ability to feel those objects, and then the motor cortex and the corticospinal tract and how they affect our ability to, uh, you know, grab objects uh, in a precision grasp. So that's basically it. Uh, thank you so much all for your time and for listening to my talk. And um, if you have any questions, I have about 10 minutes. I'm happy to, you know, take any questions on, on this topic. Thank you. All right. Uh, those who are having any questions, you can probably type it in the chat. Uh, we have one question, uh, mm -hmm. if you could say, from Mr. Vasantan. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very good question. Um, Vasantan, the short answer is, I don't know. And the reason I don't know is because it's a very new area. So when I showed you that study, you know, the, the one which looked at white metal tracks, I personally do not, I feel that it, it's good that they found correlations between reach to grass behavior uh, between these two tracks. But my hypothesis was slightly different. I felt like those two tracks, that, that those connections would play a more pronounced or a much stronger role in movement that tend to be very fast and ballistic. Like, you know, um, like cricket would be a great example. For, you know, like, and I think the, I, I, I mean, here I give an example of a baseball pitch, but one of the things that batsmen have to do is to basically look at, uh, you know, the grip, like before the ball is even released, uh, what they have to do is to look at the grip of the bowler and from that figure out how that ball would move in space in about 200 to 500 milliseconds. That's a very short period of time. My hypothesis is that these pathways have developed for for control of you know, ballistic actions. But this is a hypothesis. We really have to do a lot of control experiments you know, to be able to do it. But at this point, we're just scratching the surface uh, in terms of, you know, we've identified that these pathways exist, but what they do is, is, is really up for debate. We don't know the answer, but I think in the next 10 years, we might know some answers with more, with more studies. Okay, there's another one. Some stroke patients do develop grasp after recovery, but after an active grasp release is not possible. Uh, after an active grasp, but after okay, yes. Yeah, so I think that I I I I believe that the what you're talking about the release of grasp. I think you're talking about right. Uh, but after an active grasp release, oh yes, release is not possible. Well. I think that, you know, part of it, and again, I am, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not an expert in spasticity. I don't study spasticity. Most of work that I do in stroke is basically mild stroke survivors who, started, who, who do not even have much damage to the corticospinal, that they have damage either to the parietal or the premotor area. So I can't speak to that. But I feel like spasticity might be a contributor to that. And, you know, the ability to basically release the grasp. And you're right, it does happen. I think that might be a contributor. But again, I'm not uh, focused on that. I don't. I, I didn't even review that literature because I'm sure there's a lot of literature to show how people who are specifically are not able to, like you know, let go of because there's active tonic contraction. Uh, there's a lot of tonic contraction. They might not be able to release grafts very well or very easily. But I think that might be damage that might be specific to, uh, you know, uh, these circuits that actually inhibit the spinal cord, the spinal circuits. And I think that there might be a lot out there in terms of spasticity, spasticity but I'm not able to speculate um, on that confidently, but I do feel like that might play some role. 
how does the brain decide the grip aperture? Well, the grip aperture, simply put, if you're talking about reach to grasp, the grip aperture basically depends on how you want to grab an object and which dimension of the object is relevant. And let me see if I can make a point. Oh yeah, let's, I do have something that I can show you. So I have this like, you know, this little spray that I use to clean my glasses. So if I'm trying to grab an object this way, this width is relevant to me, right? So my fingertip is basically going to judge this width and then go wider than the with the width of this, uh, the spray bottle and then grab and come down, right? But if I'm trying to grab it this way, like this way now, this is the width to me. And in that case, my grip aperture will be even larger than this width uh, before it comes down. So the idea is that, you know, the way we want to grab an object, how wide that object is, determines how we grab the object. And the circuits that I showed you earlier, they are the ones, the, especially the canonical neurons in the ventral premotor cortex, which help us determine width, you know, and then they are the ones that tell us, okay, this is how wide that object is, and this is how you need to be expanding your grip to be able to grab the object. So that, I, I hope that answers your question, but it does depend on how we, what, how we want to grab an object. Uh, maybe get some explanation about neuroplasticity in regaining the grasp and release. Um, well, there are two things I can tell you for sure. So there is not, okay, so most of the recent studies that have been done on reach to grasp movements or, you know, between precision and power grasp, most of the recent studies that I'm aware of, they have been done in spinal cord injury patients at the, at the Northwestern and uh, Shirley Ryan Ability Lab in Chicago. And so I think we have some understanding of the roles of these pathways and what happened to this, you know, partial spinal cord injury versus complete spinal cord injury. But in terms of stroke, I think that the last slide that I showed you, right, where I said that, that the ability to individually control finger movements if there is damage to corticospinal tract, there is probably you full recovery is very unlikely based on those results that that you know John Krakow study that I, I showed earlier. But again, they were not measuring grasping; they were actually looking at finger individuation and finger individuation. As I said, you know if you go back to the latash Sotsirsky model, that it's at the lower level of control. First level is this, and all these two together, all these four together, and then at the lower level our ability to individually control these fingers is important. Um, and this, again, depends on the corticospinal tract, obviously. So depending upon the extent of damage, some function might be recovered. But if there's significant amount of damage to corticospinal tract, I think that it is going to be very hard to individually. So something like, you know, when we're buttoning our, you know, our, our clothes, clothes up, we do need fine finger control. You, it's very difficult to do it if there is no individual control of these fingers. So that kind of actions, tying up shoelaces is going to become very, very hard if there is damage, substantial amount of damage to the corticospinal tract. Motor cortex, I still feel like, you know, again, keep in mind the motor cortex in a small sense is very, very plastic. So uh, if somebody, for example, and these are studies that we've kind of done with, uh, not we've done, with, other people have done with amputees, so if, for example, somebody loses a couple of fingers, right? Then within a few months, uh, the, uh, so the representation of these fingers in the somatic sensory cortex, that is taken over by adjacent fingers and body parts in the somatic sensory cortex. The same can also, also happen in the motor cortex. So I think the motor cortex is definitely more plastic, but I don't know much. I don't think we can say much about the corticospinal tract because we only have limited amount of data studies at this point which kind of suggests that there is a cap to how much recovery can occur. Uh, within milliseconds of movements happening, how is the area involved in planning? Uh, great question. Um, the best way to think about this, look, um, two parts. 
One is that we need both. This is why we need human models as well as monkey models. So when you put a human in a scanner, you use functional imaging. Functional imaging does not have good temporal scale. It, uh, you know, the hemodynamic response is actually at the level of like two to three seconds, right? So all you're going to be able to see is which areas are activated in, say, uh, a certain you know task. So for example, you can do one uh, uh, condition in which people make reach to grass movements. Then you can do another condition in which the eyes are closed and people are just doing this, right? Like the grasping component. You can subtract one from the other and see which areas are left, and that will give you some ideas. But with monkeys, you can do intracortical recording and say, okay, you know, we are going to record from these broad arrays and see, and again, these hypotheses have come from visual neuroscience literature, so we know that the primal areas will be playing a role, primal areas will be playing a role, but they will also give you the time sequence of, you know, how activity changes in these areas, and that gives us some understanding of Okay, the parietal areas are more involved in the spatial aspects of planning. The premotor areas are more involved in actually the grip aperture and so on, because we know that that's where the canonical neurons are. And if we ablate those areas or if you know temporarily, uh, you know, inhibit those areas, we're going to see that this is going to form reach to grass would be affected. So that's how these studies have been done um, in terms of the temporal precision. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Spatial perception. I so if you if, if by spatial perception you mean uh, perception of space, that is a whole broad different study. And I think what I am what I talked about today is space perception within what we call the peripersonal space. So peripersonal space is your body and whatever we can reach within one arm distance. That's peripersonal space. The studies of reach to grasp have only focused on the peripersonal space. But when we operate in the real world, we obviously see, you know, we can see for kilometers and miles and, you know, like different objects and different hundreds of meters away. That is beyond what I have talked about today. How that perception of that space corresponds to reach to grasp, Unclear, unclear. But I think if you're talking about, you know, like egocentric versus where, where you know we look at objects with respect to the body, or one object with respect to another object uh, in the peripersonal space, then these areas, the networks that I talked about in the you know the ventral, uh, the VIP, the ventral intraparietal, the anterior intraparietal areas, the premotor areas, the dorsal, the ventral. These are, we know are going to be involved in the very personal space, but beyond that, it's a very open question, and really, I don't know the answer to that. How a concept of larger space corresponds to reach to grasp, but it's a very good question. Um, I think uh, that's that's all we have for today. Sure. Yes. Um, Right. Um, yeah, I mean, yes. Prakash, if there are any yeah. other questions as well, you know, I'm happy to answer them over email sure. as well. Email as well. So, yeah, please feel free to share my email with everybody. Sure. Um, those who are having questions or uh, later, you can email me, then I will uh, forward this to uh, Dr. Kesh. Um, again, uh, thank you very much, uh, first of all, uh, for accepting the invite immediately and uh, joining us. Uh, I, I'm sure this uh, this has been a, a, a newer ways of looking at things because as physiotherapists, the motor control part was, or the neurobiology part is not uh, an integral part of the education, uh, maybe due to yeah. lack of uh, resource to teach these aspects. So in that perspective, uh, I really want to thank you for sharing your knowledge and expertise. It's uh, nice. Well, thank you. Us. The honor is all mine. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed my time and talking to all of you. And I look forward to connecting with all of you, hopefully at some point during your careers and my career. Sure. All the best. Thank you.